Uh, hello, class. Hello from usually very sunny Sacramento, California, but it's the pre-dawn hour. <laughs> so I am up bright and early, but I'm really excited to be here. I love um, giving this talk, giving this lecture to grad students and just sort of um, exploring what career options there are in science policy in nonprofits and government. And so you guys kind of heard a little bit um, about my background from that intro, uh, but let's dive in and I'll talk a little bit about my path and then we'll dive into sort of what, you know, the wide world of science policy is. I'll talk a little bit about what it means to advocate and develop an advocacy pitch. And then we'll do a um, breakout room activity well, where I'll actually have you pitch policy ideas to each other and vote. So hopefully we can fit all that in, in like a tight two hours, but I, I think it'll be good. So let me just, um, Try to navigate to share my screen. Of course, I have like a bajillion windows open, so bear with me. Let's see. Are you guys seeing a title slide? Awesome. And I know it's early, but I encourage you guys as you're waking up for getting activated to turn your cameras on and let me see your faces because talking to my uh, camera is like just less fun. Okay, so introducing to science policy in nonprofits in government. Here we go. So about me, I was at Hopkins from 2011 to 2017 in the neuroscience department in the lab of Dr. Solange Brown, where my research looked at how neural circuits were organized. It was slice physiology, very basic research, you know, looking at how individual cells talk to one another, super fun. Um, but I sort of realized right around the stage where you guys are now, <laughs> around fourth year, like, ha, huh, geez, am I going to do a postdoc? I, I think that the academic career path, I'm not feeling called. You know, what's, I've had an existential crisis. Maybe some of you can relate. Um, what's my niche? You know, where can I bring my talents and abilities and skills? I have those, right? You know, to bear using my PhD. And so I actually began with um, sort of science outreach and communications with, an, uh, with a group on campus called Project Bridge, which is still active and sort of really enjoyed engaging with the community. We put together the, the first um, neuroscience like brain festival. I was wrapped in chicken wire with a pink sheet uh, that was shaped to look like a giant, you know, hemispheric brain. Um, and then sort of following that thread around 2015, when some of you may have, uh, some of you may have been here, it may have been before your time, when Black Lives Matter was rising to prominence in the national consciousness and there was up, um, unrest and upheavals in various cities with uh, police violence. And then of course the tragic murder of Freddie Gray in Baltimore, you know, I was there like in my lab watching. I felt very, it was very ironic that I'm sitting literally in the ivory tower from the ninth floor of Wood Basic, um, Wood Basic building, you know, watching, uh, watching things burn while I'm supposed to be doing experiments. And that's where I sort of bridged into, okay, I sort of see a role for in advocacy, in social justice, in you know, driving forward evidence-based policies to promote broadly the public health. Is, is there, you know, where can scientists do that? And that's sort of how I've chosen to take a science policy path that ultimately led me here to Sacramento, California, where until recently I was a staff consultant in the legislature. Um, I now work remotely for DC. So it's kind of funny how I kind of hopped back to the East Coast for the National Academies, which many of you may be already aware of as a um, science and technology nonprofit advisory institution. But it all began here at Hopkins, where uh, we noticed sort of a, a lack of, um, you know, student led organization around policy and advocacy. This was after Freddie Gray, which really um, was a catalyst for a lot of people around. Um, social justice and racial inequities and, you know, sort of what's the role of science in that conversation. Then certainly in 2016, there were a lot of feelings about the election and the role of science, the role of misinformation in science in that discourse. And so it was right around that season that we just said, we really need to harness all of this, you know, angst and make sure that we feel heard and seen as a valid constituency, the scientists, academics. So here's just a, a smattering of some of the various things that we advocated for. We did the March on Washington. We did the Women's March. We did um, a walkout to, to uh, protest gun violence, career panels, writing letters to policymakers. So this was where I sort of found my runway. You know, I, I, I left my, my lab and I was sort of thinking about what are the next steps, you know, going to be to pursue this path. And I'll talk about various options um, throughout this seminar. But the path that I happened to take involved kind of 
being a science policy jelly bean, I like to say, and just hopping around various opportunities and you know, taking on different skill sets as I learned them from different environments. And so I did a lot of science advocacy. This was one organization, Research America, that is a big advocate for NIH uh, biomedical research funding. And so you're putting together you know, science communications promos, you're helping scientists um, communicate their research to policymakers so that they can continue to be robustly funded. But that was just, you know, one experience. I also worked for an organization called FASAB, which represents the interests of science in the federal government, such that at the federal level, regulations that govern how science is done uh, would sort of reflect the um, expertise and perspectives of the scientists doing the research, right? And so we were sort of that intermediary. Um, it was sort of a science policy experience forming the on-campus chapter and some of the business side and the political side of that. I had a short but extremely stimulating and intellectually interesting stint at a DOD think tank where I worked on science policy in the context of national security issues. Um, you, you know, the topic at the time was supply chain, which is coming up again in the time of COVID, but um, the security of our microelectronics um, and how at various points from their origin and manufacture to their shipping and delivery to their integration and, and deployment and retirement, there are all of these vulnerable points where they can be tampered with or malicious software, malware, you know, uh, can, can be added. And how does DOD sort of protect against that? What are new technologies to sort of make um, these technologies resilient? And then, of course, I, there is definitely a science policy aspect to social justice, right? Because when one community is being systemically um, brutalized, that's a public health issue, right? And so that's just sort of a smattering of the, the types of things that I've done in the world of science policy, which sort of begs the question, what is it, right? I just sort of gave you like a, a laundry list of things, but like, what is this field really? I like to think of it more as a where than a what, right? I see science policy as all of the activities and engagement that happen at the intersection, right? At the crosshairs of where subject matter experts, you know, content experts are meeting with decision makers, power brokers, all of that I would consider science policy. And so, yeah, it definitely is a super wide net, but that's really great because there's so much diversity and there's something for everyone. Um, so, but within, you know, the big wide world of science policy, we do sort of split them out into at least two um, camps, right? This is, can sort of help you think about uh, some fundamental differences. One, and this is sort of the classic one we first think about, is science for policy. That is, that's usually what we mean when we say evidence-based decision-making, you know, fact-driven, you know, policy-making. It's the idea that when we are uh, building a policy proposal, that of all of the various factors that go into the discussion, you know, value sets, certainly politics and relationships and, you know, all of that horse trading, that in addition, facts, you know, and facts that have been gathered through the systematic and reproducible, you know, process of research, that that needs to be an element of the conversation. That's science for a policy, science informing policy. So here's an example, COVID, right? So Johns Hopkins, our wonderful home, um, has a, you know, online COVID-19 tracker where you can put in, you know, a, a location you're interested in and pull up all these status reports on who's vaccinated, who's getting infected, at what rates, and yada, yada. And so the idea is that, you know, policy researchers or policymakers staff can go look at their district and sort of see, okay, you know, would a mask mandate make sense? Um, you know, do we need to close again? You know, do we need to start reinforcing social distancing in bars and restaurants? So this is the idea of making evidence available to decision makers that helps them then inform, in this case, a public health uh, guidelines, right? But then there's also policy for science, right? This is the policies, rules, and procedures that govern how the enterprise of science is regulated, how it's funded, how it's run. That's things like how many students in a grad program, how long is a grad program before they kind of boot you out? Is it okay to require a publication before you are allowed to graduate in every field? Um, what about parental leave? 
um, you know, uh, like, uh, like, um, let's see, um, what am I trying to say? It's early here. Health coverage for, for grad students, right? So uh, workforce issues, right? Um, things like this seminar, encouraging grad students to consider careers outside academia. I won't call them alternative careers because more people are not becoming PIs than are. So really that's the alternative path, but that's the conversation for another day. So these are conversations about how is the institution of science run? And that's absolutely a political process. What the NIH and NSF choose to fund in those uh, you know, meetings where they select you know, the, the small amount of grants that they're gonna be selected, that's a political process. Um, when we pushed COVID to the forefront of, of everything, uh, that was a political process. And so science for policy is also a really interesting place to work. So here's an example of a, excuse me, policy for science. Here's an interesting example of a policy for science type of question, right? So here, what you're seeing is um, the NIH budget over time. And between the red lines, there was a massive increase like in the early 2000s, like the budget like doubled under Francis Collins's um, over leadership. And so people were super excited, you know, departments like way expanded their labs. Um, they were taking in tons of graduate students. They were, you know, ramping up their projects, thinking that they're gonna get all of this money but that growth turned out to be really unsustainable. Uh, and actually you can notice after the um, portion where there's the red dotted lines, there's actually kind of a plateau and a drop off. So this had rippling effects throughout the um, academic community, which some of you may be feeling experientially, where even though there was all this money, the total number of competing awards, the blue line and that bottom graph stayed the same. The number of applications shot up because now there are all these people in the pipeline you know, that want to get funded. But then the success rate goes down. Now it's something like in the teens percent of meritorious applications that get funded. So what does this mean? Well, it takes you a long time to become an R01 funded investigator, if at all. This is the average um, age of the first time a PI gets their R01 equivalent. This is, this is insane. So this is a policy for science question. How do we fund research, right? So fascinating. But going back to sort of science policy writ large, if we're thinking about um, sort of the more classic example of science for a policy, science informed policy, I know that you guys are in the cell molecular biology department. Okay, so it's like, well, you know, if I were going to work on policy, maybe you're thinking this, it has to be something very specific to my PhD. So something related to genetics or something related to human biology, or, you know, that's not necessarily the case, right? So there's a scientific element or a scientific angle to nearly all issues. And if I certainly am any example, um, one can have any background, might happen to be neuroscience, but apply a scientific lens, a mind uh, that is able to think critically, ask good questions, know how to purview data, know when data and stats are BS, because quite honestly, there's just a lot of junk you know, being thrown around. So you can take any one of these issue areas and apply the scientific framework and absolutely be an asset in a science policy role. And so here, here are some ones that are sort of more science related because they're in health, they're in environmental quality, how do we protect our natural resources, you know, thinking about climate, how do we manage our water. But there's also a scientific angle to things like, trans I work on the transportation committee for a year and a half. There's transportation issues that have a scientific angle. There's mobility equity issues, who's able to ride trains and who's not, what's the cost of a train ticket. There's science to optimal times for trains to be running, like all of these things. There are numbers, there are ways that you can have motivated reasoning to come up with policies to motivate where you build highways and where you have traffic lights and all of these things, right? Agriculture, energy and utilities. And so in my work, I've seen folks with backgrounds from physics to chemistry to neuroscience to the humanities playing a really critical role as a science, as a science expert or a science policy consultant in each of these domains. So here I'm sort of belaboring the point, you know, you, you can work on anything. Okay, so I talked a little bit about, you know, science policy careers. Um, what are some options? It is a big, big, wide, wide universe, but here's sort of um, me blossoming it out for you. And so one can do, um, I'm gonna start sort of more uh, closer to the data and it neutral fact finding and then all the way to like straight up lobbying, right? And so you can be in a sort of a nonprofit policy 
research institution where you're generating data. Think Rand Corporation, you know, they're, they're doing experiments and they, they publish papers similar to how you guys publish papers now, right? There's, um, let's see, uh, let me see how I wanna go around this, this blossom. You can do science communication, right? This is actually really quite important, taking uh, language that's often a bit jargony and inaccessible and making it relatable and resonant to those power brokers that are looking to this evidence to help inform their, their thought process. Okay, um, when it comes time for policy to be implemented or executed, we think of our oversight and regulatory bodies, right? How are we going to measure the success of our policies? That, that in itself is a science, right? Let's see, certainly there's advocacy, which I we're gonna talk more about. Program management, which is a bit of what I do at the academies, as in there's a program, as in running a workshop, running a conference, overseeing a policy paper being written, um, overseeing a, um, a policy idea come to fruition, a policy idea being like, we think this was a real proposal that I worked on in transportation, right? We want there to be a uh, fair, free, like no, no cost uh, transit, buses and rail for community college students in San Bernardino County, right? And so that bill did not pass, but had it passed, there might have been a science policy institute that would have evaluated that program, advised the sort of structuring of that program, um, helped design the implementation of that program. So, so it goes all the way from data, just raw data, spewing it out into the universe to sort of from that data idea generation, what are some you know, policy proposals? From that to advocacy, I have a policy proposal I really like. Hey, decision maker, please take on my idea. Um, then there's policy implementation. We have the idea, now we have to execute it, right? And then there's policy sort of um, oversight and, and regulation. Again, sort of you know managing the implementation and also funding. Okay, so now let's do a bit of a deeper dive. I feel like I'm talking really fast. Feel free to interrupt me with questions as well. So I'm gonna um, do a bit of a deeper dive and show you guys like a um, like an example of a person with a scientific background who went into this particular field. So we'll talk about comms and advocacy, policy development and policy analysis, science diplomacy, which is really cool, but um, I feel kind of under under celebrated, and then policy implementation and oversight. So first, comms and advocacy. Here we have a, a dear friend and colleague of mine who I just highly respect. She's amazing, Adriana Bankston, also a neuroscientist. And she is a rock star. She's on the board of directors for several um, nonprofit advocacy organizations, including ones that represents the interest of postdocs and does research um, that collects data on the experience of postdocs, what they're getting paid, do they have health insurance coverage? Are they getting maternity leave? How long are they in how long are they in their postdoc? What are they getting funded? Because that hadn't been collected systemically. So she started an organization that was doing surveys around the US and collecting them systemically and writing papers, and then bringing those papers to conferences and using those papers to advocate for essentially better labor practices for postdocs. She also happens to sit as a um, now editor in chief on a science policy journal, where if you guys are interested in learning more, I encourage you to go read the articles are free for the journal of science policy and governance. So her like, her um, shtick, you know, her lane, is she's making science accessible. She translates um, research uh, to specific audiences. She's really talented at using science to tell compelling stories like the plight of struggling postdocs and to shape a narrative. Given the plight of struggling postdocs, here's what we should do about it, right? Um, similarly, using that science to inform compelling and persuasive outreach. The point I want to make from this is that data by itself is just numbers on a page, right? It takes people, it takes a perspective, it takes a framework to make that data come to life, right? And that's what we mean by comms and advocacy. It's when you have a particular value set, in this case, you know, you know, equitable working conditions, and then you're gathering data in support, you know, of that, of that argument. Okay. Policy development and analysis. This is more like in your legislative domain. This is where you might be a staffer, you know, you're on the Hill, Sacramento or DC, advising decision makers, lots of paperwork, long nights, often not as much pay, but what you do get 
as sort of as the counterbalance to that is a tremendous amount of influence because you're in the room. You're in the room sitting next to Senator so-and-so, Representative so-and-so when decisions are being made and they're so high level, they, they, they can't know all the details of everything at once. And so they look to you, the staffer, the science policy consultant or expert to be feeding them fast facts, right? And so you're there to be sort of a trusted um, arbiter of information. You're, you kind of have your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the policy field, what new evidence is emerging. You may be called upon to know who are the thought leaders in a field to, to bring forward expert testimony. Um, people love it when they can have, you know, a PhD with a fancy institution behind their name to come and say, oh, wow, I love your bill, right? Um, or if you're not in the legislature, there are lots of institutions that are nonetheless funded by the government and the government can then, like the academy, the government then can ask that institution, hey, do a study on, in my case, um, accelerating progress in research for tra traumatic brain injury. And here's like a you know, couple of millions of dollars or whatever, and you have a year and come back to us with 10 concrete policy proposals and we might implement one, right? Policy development and analysis is one type of thing that you can do. So here's Dr. Kelly Fleming. She has a background in chemical engineering, but she now is a really talented um, transportation policy analyst at this institution in California for energy, the environment and the economy. So when I worked in the transportation committee and we were doing that bill proposal on transit, free fair transit for like low income community service youth, she was my go to liaison in this institute for what's the research, um, you know, where's the research being done, uh, who, who has been evaluated, what, what's the evidence for and against, what's this going to cost, who's this going to benefit, you know, like all of these questions. So it was really neat that I'm a scientist in the government and she's a scientist in this policy institution. And we were able to talk to one another and exchange information. That was a really satisfying experience, I think, for us both. Okay, science diplomacy. Um, science diplomacy is sort of the idea that there are lots of uh, issues of at a global scale um, that requires uh, you know, a, a scientific collaboration in also in the context of foreign relations, right? So think migration, um, natural resource management, shared borders, like shared rivers, um, shared uh, you know, fields of a precious natural resource, think COVID, right, travel restrictions. And so scientists need to be a part of that conversation, but they also have to understand whatever nuanced um, geopolitical, um, tensions, you know, may be going on. And so it's sort of an additional level of complexity. So, so they're there overall to advance both a scientific objective, but perhaps also to advance their representative nation's foreign policy objective. So you can think State Department, or you can think more of a, an organization like the WHO, right? And so they're there to help foster um, international collaborations, using science as that common language and using science um, as a tool to like bridge the gap and, and solve common problems. So here's Dr. Marga Soler, PhD in a field similar to yours. And here she is at the World Economic Forum, you know, and she uh, will be invited to speak and give expert testimony on all sorts of issues related to, I think, what she speaks on, and I'm now not remembering, that issues related to, to, to like global, global health, you know, global, global health issues. Okay, policy implementation and oversight. Um, think your FDA, think your, um, you know, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Of course, I'm totally blanking, but you know, <laughs> often these are executive branch organizations that are providing um, administrative support, infrastructural support and oversight to programs that are running. So they're providing funding, they're uh, sort of um, providing the, you know, programmatic infrastructure, they're developing regulatory framework, this is where accountability is happening. So here, Dr. Ajiboye, who's also from Hopkins, is a biologist, she's working on tobacco regulation and tobacco, um, tobacco policy enforcement at the FDA. So here are all the great places you can do science policy inside government and outside government, right? So think tanks, policy research institutions, you could work uh, for a private law firm or you know, a company could hire you out to represent their interests, certainly in academia, 
biotech, um, particularly, I guess, in, in your guys' cases, you know, pharma and um, device manufacturing companies are interested in hiring science policy experts to help them, you know, move their product or understand the landscape, regulatory landscape, which the product, you know, would be entering the market. Okay, so that's just like a whirlwind, <laughs> you know, like ah, into what science policy could be. If you were interested, what skills might you need, right? And so here, this is a puzzle piece. The blue is sort of the science know-how and the yellowish um, is the policy know-how. And so what's great is that you already have probably more than half of these things, right? So here are some things that scientists, just by virtue of our training and often by virtue of our the nature that brings us to this type of work, tend to be really resilient, right? I think that we have a high frustration tolerance given how much experiments just I think fail, <laughs> and you have to go back into the lab and rebuild, okay? Um, we are naturally curious. We're internally driven. You know, we, we know how to self-teach. We have a big, uh, we're very comfortable with uncertainty and nuance, right? Like, at, you know, we realize as scientists that actually we don't know most things. We're constantly challenging assumptions. And so being comfortable in uncertainty, being comfortable in chaos, finding order, you know, out of masses of numbers and being really systematic in disorder is something that scientists tend to be really good at. And then, of course, understanding how to be rigorous, you know, understanding how to follow a process and, um, like, repeat that process in a way that it's um, uh, precise. Okay, what's the policy side? And the policy side, you would get by virtue of work experience, right? There's no need to go get an MPH or go get a certificate. Um, Entry-level policy jobs would are like designed to teach you this. They would teach you like how government works, like how does a bill become a law? This is something a lot of scientists do have to work on, although I'm sure all of you are excellent and very charismatic communicators, but some interpersonal skills, like how to talk to non <laughs> subject matter experts in a way where they feel um, that they're not at all being spoken down to, that they don't feel they're being condescended to, you know, that you're relatable, that you're able to sort of walk between both worlds, right? Um, uh, familiar, familiarity with policy issues, by that I mean sort of understanding where the big um, fault lines are. Like, okay, in the issue of say, I don't know, uh, climate change, natural land use management, like pick a very specific example, you know, there are three big ideas and here's where they clash. And here are the entities that are sort of the major um, thought leaders of those, you know, of those big ideas. So you kind of have a sense of, of the landscape and who's pushing what and where they sort of have tension, right? Um, and then practical policy skills, that refers to things like negotiating, knowing how to read bills, um, knowing how to like process or come up with an amendment, potential change to a bill, knowing how to manage the interests of competing stakeholders. So a lot of policy comes down to both knowing the science but also having some emotional intelligence and being able to understand the nuances of relationships that are going on and understanding that those relationships are not like, a wrench in the process, like human emotions getting in the way. They're actually really integral to the process. And so understanding that and being savvy to that is, is also really important. So with all of that, if you're like, man, I, I have some of those skills, but I'd like to get more, how could you prepare? Well, here's a list of things. I won't read them. You guys can, can take a look. But many of these things you can start doing right now, especially because Science Policy Group is still totally a thing. <laughs> and they support most of these um, activities, right? And so uh, even just beginning with something as basic as science communication, could you write a 300-word abstract in layman's language that your Uber driver could understand? Like that's like a very, um, I think, foundational task, uh, embl emblemic emblematic, emblematic, indicative of the type of work that a science policy person might do. Um, so with that, let me, I've been talking a lot, let me kind of pause and take the temperature and take any questions and what, um, as I'm, I have a, a lot more content to go, but I'd be interested to hear from you, whether um, openly or in the chat, what other questions are sort of pinging around that way I can try to like weave them in as I keep going, so. What are you guys thinking so far?
I can't tell if there's something in the chat. Let me just see. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, I'll keep going. Awesome. Okay, so um, I'll go through this quickly, but one common uh, like ramp. Yes, the internships exist. One common ramp from where you are to um, where, you know, like for example, I am or where other people in my position are, are science policy internships and fellowships. Huge caveat to say this is not, this should not be a barrier or any sort of gateway. It just happens to be, these happen to be programs that are sort of custom made to handhold you, right, in that transition. They're designed to be often six month, one year, two year long experiences where they say, oh, we're so happy we have a STEM expert. We're going to like teach you all of the yellow puzzle pieces that you may not have. We're gonna put you in a training environment with a mentor that totally gets that you're a, you know, in learning mode and we're gonna give you some training wheels and that it's, so it's a very supportive and structured environment. That being said, outside of policies and internships, there is such a wide, wide world of like entry level opportunities out there that are just a bit, you have to like kind of, do, you know, put in some elbow grease to find them because it's not, you know, like, hey, we'll take 50 students and apply here, right? Um, but in your local community, um, there are, are for sure advocacy groups or, you know, local leaders or local um, coalitions that are often, often looking for experts to help them strengthen um, their science policy message. But back to fellowships, I just want to say that this, this should not be like something that gatekeeps. So, you know, an opportunity for you to bring your scientific expertise um, to bear, for example, in Congress or in the executive office, there are opportunities available, some while you're in grad school. So I'm at the academy. So one of, I think it's available while you're in grad school, is called the Christine Mir Zion Fellowship. And it, it's three months long. And so that's a great opportunity. Um, anything I'm saying, I will give you the guys the slides afterwards and I will open up my um, email for like one-on-ones if you guys wanna know more specifically about certain opportunities. And so you don't have to like remember all of this. And there's also um, a really great like Excel spreadsheet that lovely people maintain that offers uh, or that describes like all or like nearly all of the internships and fellowships in your area, which ones are um, specifically open for like underrepresented minorities or women or black students or, you know, like wh whatever. And so uh, you can sort of, the timelines and what it's due and if you have to be graduated or not or are you a citizen or not so these databases exist and so um if you guys were interested in that you could start looking in and um think about it so here but here's just a smattering of options some of these may be familiar triple as is a big one that you guys may know of that's um like a one or two year fellowship often in the somewhere in the executive branch although they, they do do like a handful of legislative placements a department of energy and dod um also have really interesting science policy fellowship opportunities, particularly for biomedical scientists. Um, let's see the presidential management fellows and sort of policy, you know, like executive leadership. And that's feds in the states. And more and more of these are popping up um, because they see the success um, of older state run fellowships, like one of the older ones being the one in California, which I was a part of CCST. But and now they put you both in the legislature and in the executive branch. So you can be in the Senate committee, the transportation committee, the health committee, or you can be working for the air resources board or the, um, let's see, I'm trying to think, or like uh, like an oversight committee. Um, and then some of these other fellowships are in other states. I think this is Missouri, and I think there's one in Virginia and they're trying really hard to get one in Texas. So fingers crossed, but there's more. You can do it at a nonprofit. <laughs> Research America does like biomedical advocacy. Um, NASM, where I'm currently, has the Resign Fellowship for like policy program management. Let's see, with Merck, and some of these are from, um, uh, you know, um, businesses. Mozilla has some. There's some interestingly in IT and software now. So suffice it to say, there's science policy enough for everybody. I had a blank slide here to remind myself to slow down and drink some water, <laughs> and also to like see some questions. Okay. When would the best time be to explore and participate in internships? Yeah, okay. You guys are all fourth year. So it's, I hate to say it, but like it totally depends, right? Because, oh, so one of the fellowships that I did was while I was a student and it was through the Professional Development Careers Office, PDCO or BCI. 
Biomedical Careers Initiative. And they essentially allowed me to go on like a little mini sabbatical where I put my entire experience, my thesis on pause and went off campus to Bethesda, like moved for three months to do um, like Capitol Hill work. And then I came back and I was still paid and everything. And I picked up my work where it left off. And so with that, the timing a lot depended on my mice because I like was kind of attached to the breeding schedule. So some of it is when you want to graduate. Some of it is what's a good pause point. Do you have a paper you're working on? I guess what I mean to say is that there's no hard and fast rule. Like in November, like you have to, it's not like college applications or something like that. Every month there's a deadline for something. Um, I would say though, maybe in the fall, just because that's like the academic cycle that a lot of groups seem to be on, like CCST, for example, which I happen to know, or like AAAS, which is due in November, which I happen to know, those are due in the fall. But both of those also require you to be out or within like a month of being, like you have to have defended. And so this is something that you would talk, that you would look at your timeline and talk to your advisor and talk to the PDCO people to, to work it out. Um, working remotely, yeah. Um, as I think about myself and other science policy colleagues, we're almost all working remote. The nature of our work is very remote friendly. It's, it's we're, I'm on a computer and, and I write all day and I, and I run meetings <laughs> and I run meetings there hasn't been a ton of value lost from not being in person. And so as I'm thinking about the science policy um, workspaces in the DC metropolitan area, nearly all of them, I would say, have right now a, um, a remote work option just because there is not a pressing need for humans to be together for the type of intellectual engagement that you normally do. Okay, all right, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep going. Woo! All right, so now we're switching gears a little bit like chapter two, <laughs> and I'm gonna talk a little bit about advocating for policies, right? And then we're gonna have some breakout rooms where you guys are gonna pitch to each other. And so it's, you know, you may not feel like, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing. That's fine, that's okay. Consider this just like exposure to kind of get your feet wet, get a feel for it. You're not meant to like be good at it or get it right. You're just sort of meant to explore and get a feeling and, and play around with, what this feels like, right? So I, just, I want you to guys kind of relax and have fun with it. I say that because when I do this and people feel unprepared, they're like, you know, you got like grad students are just so like performance oriented. I'm like, oh my God, relax. So how a bill becomes a law, a bridge diversion, but basically, you know, the process, you guys remember that video, maybe I'm, you know, millennial age, but that video of like um, the little rolled up scroll and he like goes through Congress. Um, yeah, that's all a lie. I mean, it's like, it's so oversimplified. I was amazed to find how much more complicated it is. And so, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is there is an idea, right? And that, that idea has to find someone to like adopt it. It has to find a policymaker to agree to become its author. An author is a funny term of phrase because the author just means that they will own that bill and carry it forward. It does not mean that they wrote it per se. A lot of bills, and this is not a bad thing, a lot of bills are written by advocacy groups or lobbyists, which I know is like such a dirty word, but it's actually really not. It's just, you know, it's just a, a, an interest group that are subject matter experts that honestly know what they're talking about way more than the general um, knowledge policymakers and their staff do. And so it's part of the way that the system works um, that bills get fed up to an author, right? Okay, so then the bill gets drafted into special legislative code. And when I say code, it really is sort of like computer code. There are if then statements, you know, there are clauses that will trigger certain things to happen if a certain budget level is reached. And so it's all very legal easy. So you have to get that right. And then depending on the subject of the bill, you guys may know this, it goes into a committee that like owns that subject. So bills dealing with education go to the education committee and those dealing with health go to the health committee and you get it. So that committee is, it, the idea is that it's supposed to work out the kinks. This is where you get down and dirty. Bills are in their infancy. I mean, they are like a thought. They're like a half formed thought sometimes at this stage. And it's the job of those committee members who are elected and their staff, like me and my colleagues to be like, so, so what are you trying to do exactly? Okay, well, this language doesn't do that, but I can like I'll, I'll like I can write you new language that I think does that, but that's you know, and so you so you try to like bring their 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 baby like into into fruition. 
and then hopefully it gets out of that sort of subject matter specific committee after it's like worked out all of the kinks. And, and it can go, and, and here it can sort of cycle. It can just like go through the revisions for a while. It may die here, have to come back another year. So one point I wanna make with all of this text is to say, policy is definitely like science, a incremental and iterative process. It's not always bad that a bill dies. Sometimes it's really great because that bill is not ready for prime time and they need to go back and like workshop it. But if it gets out of subject matter specific committee, then the idea is that it goes to the whole assembly or Senate. So it's like, oh, we're ready to like show you off to like this entire audience. And that's where they sort of vote on it. Then they repeat the whole thing on the other side of the our, our bicameral legislature. And then it has to go to the governor <laughs> and then it's signed. And so at each of these sort of transfer points, bills are negotiated, bills are amended, but where we sort of, we as in science policy people come into play is each of those handoffs is an opportunity for an advocacy uh, engagement where bills are amended and policies can shift. So let me talk to you guys a bit more about like those intersections, right? And so um, certainly one can come up with an idea, you know, you, you, you take your favorite paper from RAND or from NASM and you go, oh, like we really should implement recommendation, you know, seven, you find someone that will want to author it or sponsor it, they bring the bill. And so that's like one place where you can work. They bring the bill before the committee and you, you can be working in the committee. That's another place where you can work and you take the bill and you're like, all right, I have to put this into like proper language. I have to think about how this bill fits in the larger framework of all of the other bills on this topic that are going on. Is it broadly in line with our state or nation's like other priorities? What are the, what are the cost pressures, blah, blah, blah. You can uh, engage with the bill when it's being heard in a committee publicly, obviously for transparency, and they bring in ex experts to speak usually on camera. C-SPAN is not the most fascinating channel, but you might see PhDs on TV there speaking for or against the bill. And typically you, you'll hear something like, um, you know, it, it's a, uh, you know, hello, you know, I'm Dr. Chanel Matney with the National Academies and I'm here to stand in strong support. It's always strong support, never lukewarm support. I'm here to stand in strong support of Senate Bill 218, which will blah. You know, as a representative of the academies, we believe that, insert mission statement here, um, you know, this bill will insert some facts here. And because of that, I stand in strong support and you sit down. And then you have like 50 other people that do that. Um, that's another place where you can sort of like have your time um, at the mic. Uh, but, but in addition to sort of um, the scientists that are at the mic, you also have people that are speaking to their lived experience or they're speaking to their other relevant, you know, professional uh, connection with that policy issue or idea. It also sort of matters who your audience is. Is your audience the author of the bill because you really want them to change something? Is your audience the people voting on the bill because you want to influence um, yay, their, their I or their no? Is your um, audience a particular caucus? Like I'm in California, so there's like the Delta caucus, the, the Central Valley caucus, there's um, there's a burrito caucus, but that's usually not relevant to most policies. Okay, um, are you looking for someone who's known to be very politically um, like powerful? to kind of take this issue under their wing to be a champion for you? Um, or are you lobbying the governor to say, hey, like when this bill gets to you like five months from now, like please sign it, right? Okay, so these are all the sort of intersections where uh, pop, uh, science policy consultants, advocates, advisors um, are like sort of inserting themselves. So when I say um, advocating, inserting yourself, making a pitch, what is a pitch? You know, maybe you guys um, have had experience with, you know, sort of, um, you know, writing a position statement or at least thinking of one, uh, like in a Facebook status or something <laughs> for, for a bill. And so here are the sorts of questions that you might think about when a bill, like, for example, there was a bill, I remember when I was in grad school, HR something, H HR something, it's HR1, that said that we were going to tax grad students um, for the for the for the full rate of compensation. So that means that even though we only take home whatever we take home, that they were going to tax us on also like the tuition, you know, that's like sort of calculated as part of our grad experience, which is like, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. And that, so, you know, that re that made us raise a big stink. And so you think about these questions, right? Who would the bill help or hurt, you know, us? Uh, the benefits of voting yes or no. Um, I guess the government gets more money from 
like us poor people, you know, the cost of voting yes or no, grad students are gonna starve. Um, who else supports or opposes the bill and why? Let me pause here for an important point. Um, even when you have, uh, even when you have a bill that you're just like obscenely opposed to, I think it's really important. I really think it's, it's very important to assume good intent on the part of the bill sponsor, because often there is a reason in their mind that from their perspective feels very rational for why this needs to happen. And perhaps they may have incomplete information about the negative effects that it causes. And so something that I learned working a lot with the majority party here in California and the minority party is that demonizing the other and like, wow, you're such an idiot. I really hate this bill. And, and so, and there's a lot of like nasty rhetoric that goes back and forth, like, you know, when, when people are in front of cameras. But what was amazing was that behind the scenes, like staff to staff, when it came down to brass tacks and it was like, what are you really trying to do? Oftentimes the underlying problem that was trying to be solved was a real one. We just may have disagreed about the methods. And so it came down to sort of returning to a basic level of respect and empathy that you are trying to solve a problem. At, uh, and then you think that this bill taxing grad students is a solution. Maybe I don't think it's a problem. I disagree with your solution, but you know, I'll do my best to acknowledge that you're coming from a starting point, hopefully of good faith, right? And so given how much polarization and angst there is between different factions, I kind of wanted to put that plug in there. Okay, you think about um, your, uh, your allies, who else supports this bill with me? You definitely think about your opponents who's opposing the bill and what are they saying and why? And then of all of the clamoring voices out there, why should your perspective be the most prioritized over others? So these are the types of things you think about when you're putting together an advocacy pitch. And of course, since we're scientists, you love it to be chock full of data. Okay, so this is great. We're, at, we're gonna be at about an hour. So we're gonna look at some examples of fact sheets. It's essentially a written advocacy pitch. And these fact sheets are created by a lawmaker's office for a bill that they're um, carrying. So that they that they hand out, you know, like flyers to convince pe to, for people to know what the bill is and for, pe for people to vote for it, right? So it does a couple of things. It's one page. It's like a hard and fast rule, at least here in California. It has to be a page. It's like biblical. Um, it lets you know, like in, in a line or two, what the bill does, okay, and that like what problem it's trying to solve, some background information, relevant, you know, context, and then it makes an argument. It takes a position. It, this is not a neutral, just here's data and make up your own mind. No, no, no. It's it's definitely you know pretty pointed, and it, it's a it's a it's an advocacy you know like weapon. So I can barely read this. I don't know if you guys can, but so so here is a fact sheet about um, family leave, right? So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to pull out some like important nuggets where the author was sort of tying a fact or a finding to a value or to a or to an argument. So they're saying, um, okay, under current law in California, too few people are eligible for parental leave. Okay, or only those who work for an employer of a certain number that has a certain number of people in it. Then they make a sort of a value statement. This leaves too many California workers without family leave. You know, there's too many people without leave. That's sort of a value statement. Then, then they have some facts. Experts, you know, us, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, recommends that infants need to be with their families to develop normally. Okay, great. Because of this, we think that there should be family leave. Specifically, our bill will do this, that, and the other. This measure will benefit 3 million Californians. Again, a fact. Um, you know, we, you know, we, and then sort of more value statements, you know, we think that, um, you know, supporting the development of our children is a good thing, value statement. And so you sort of see how they are taking tidbits of data, but embedding them in an argument about the, you know, importance of people being able to go home to be with their, their newborns, right? So this is an example of a sort of a, a position statement. Let's look at another one. Let's see, this one is about... <clears throat> agricultural lands management in the context of climate change. So here, Mr. Cholera 
wants to help farms shift from livestock farming, which is um, yeah, has problems for the environment, and instead use that land to uh, grow sustainable and less water intensive crops. And so they say, okay, um, you know, we, we grow this much corn and we grow this much soybean. Um, let's see, there's a high demand for foraging land. It's going to increase. If the foraging land increases, it's going to devastate our working lands and impact groundwater and GHG, which is greenhouse gas emissions. Um, these greenhouse gas emissions are really bad, and here's data about why it's bad. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, the world population is growing by this much. We have to switch to plant based farming, and here's why. Okay. So, so you guys sort of get the idea, right? And so the person takes a position, there's a problem. They have some data and they have some facts and they're sort of telling you what value that they're prioritizing. In this case, trying to save agricultural lands. In the previous case, letting parents go home to be with their infants, right? Okay, so the idea is that this goes to a person who will then take the paper to their boss and you know, let the boss know, hey, this bill is circulating. You know, We should think about how you're gonna vote. So what we're gonna do, oh, I'm so good on time. For the next um, hour, is we're going to do this twice. So everyone will have a chance to do all of the roles. So what we're going to do is I've picked a bill for you guys. Um, and I picked a controversial one. Well, it was it was at the time. Maybe it won't be for us. Um, and so there's going to be two groups. One is going to be senators. And one is going to be advocates. And of the advocates, there'll be like four different groups. And you'll go into four breakout rooms you know, for your four groups. And you'll be separate for that time while the advocates sort of figure out their pitch and the senators are going to hang out with me. Okay. So after um, the advocates go and like figure out their pitch and the senators hang out with me and we're going to talk, we'll come back to the main room and the advocates will take turns like two minutes each per group. You'll like pick a, a spokesperson to um, pitch to the senators. You know, you should vote or you should not vote for this bill. Afterwards, the senators, if you want to ask questions to the advocates, you're welcome to do that. But then you're, you're, we're going to do a roll call vote, as we would like in you know parliamentary procedure. And then, and then we'll see what happens. The thing about the advocates is that I've assigned you positions, right? And I'm going to give you like background material. I'm going to give you all the material that you need. It's going to be way too much for you to read, which is fine. And so based on your stakeholder group or your position, you're going to have to like represent that interest in your argument. Okay, so first, where I'm gonna like talk about the bill a little bit so we're all on the same page. Then we're gonna split where the senators stay with me and the four advocacy groups, which I'll assign in a minute, will go off and like talk about their, their constituency and talk about how they feel about the bill. Then we'll all come back and we're gonna hear those pitches. Senators can ask questions if they want, then we're gonna vote. Then we'll reverse and everyone who is a senator will then be an advocate and everyone who's an advocate will then be a senator. And I hope we can do that in an hour. Make sense? Solid. Okay. All right. So first, first things first. Um, try to think how I want to do this because there's like a lot of stuff going on. Okay. Well, first, let me just talk to you about the bill, really quick. All right, because it's just easier for me to do that. Um, this bill uh, is a real bill, and um, the the idea of the bill is to delay school start times statewide such that you can't start later than eight thirty. Why is this a thing? Well, the average school start time in California had been like 8.05. There are some people that were starting even as early as seven. And there was a lot of research that showed that kids were not getting enough sleep and they were suffering as a result, both physi physiologically, you know, in their bodies, but also mentally, poor grades, um, depression, their circadian rhythms are shifted in such a way that they sleep late and wake up late. So this is just totally like counter to their biology. So we have to have a later start time. So Senator, Port the Senator Portentino, real Senator, real bill, um, wanted to push this forward, and, but it was controversial and I don't wanna like steal your thunder. So I want you guys to go in the breakout rooms and like talk about it, uh, but, but that's the bill. So what I'm gonna do now is give you guys your material. So don't go yet. So, okay, so first what we're gonna do is I want you guys to know your breakout rooms. So bear with me. I made a Google spreadsheet for you guys so you can just, see your breakout room and, and just go there yourself, but don't go yet. Okay, these are your breakout, and we're doing round one, okay? So there's gonna be four groups, four breakout rooms, and the senators stay here, but don't go. All right, so that's thing number one that you need. 
<clears throat> thing number two that you need, okay, everyone, what bill are we doing right now? We're doing bill 328. Okay, so everyone take this little backgrounder. Oh, I have to close it. It's in use. Okay, hold on. My computer's yelling at me. I'm uploading a um I'm uploading a document. Okay, everyone has this document. And it just has links for like internet articles that give you background, like neutral background on the bill, and then like articles in support and articles in opposition. So you can kind of, I didn't want you to like be on Google, like, you know, lost. So you can sort of use that as a resource. All right. Everyone takes that. Now, the next documents I'm going to drop are group specific. So it'll say SB 328 group one. And if you're group one, you take it. If not, ignore it. So I'll drop four documents, one for each group. And this is basically just a, um, a worksheet for you to fill in, like a, a guide for your advocacy pitch, right? So it tells you um, what your constituency group, it tells you what your constituency group is. It'll ask you to uh, specify if you're for or against. And then it'll ask you, and it'll ask you like, put down some reasons why, okay? All right, so group one, here you go. Group two, here you go. Group three, here you go. And you can pick a person to share a screen and, and be the scribe for you. All right. So you have you know your breakout rooms. Everyone has the backgrounder. It's just like background information. Um, okay. And then then you have your like work the worksheet for you to fill out. Does this make sense? Okay, so please assign yourselves to your, I need to open the rooms, I think, let me see. No, they're open, okay. Assign yourselves to your rooms. Senators stay here and we're gonna chat. <laughs> and then I think we're gonna do this for like 25 minutes, the whole thing, like 25 minutes. So we have time to switch. So that I want everyone to be able to do everything. Okay, all right, go for it. So we should have, I think, how many senators should I have? <laughs> uh, I don't know, one, two, three, four. Is everyone here a senator? Okay, okay. well, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna proceed after I hydrate a little bit. Okay, so um, this, I thought this could be, since you guys are such a big class, this is a nice opportunity for us to have a little Q&A with me, right? Um, I sped through that presentation, I talked about a lot of stuff, and so I'm happy to sort of talk a little bit more about specific roles, um, time, timing, fellowships, differences between working like at, you know, at a nonprofit versus in government, in DOD versus in the legislature, at a um, scientific member society, like a, so you guys are like molecular biologists. So, you know, you have um, ASBNB, the Association of molecular biology and micro you know something something but anyway you know your 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 paid member societies they all have science policy wings and regulatory wings that um do science policy work um doing grassroots work so i want this to be more your time it's also time for me to like hydrate and so let me know what you'd like to talk about thinking about a career in science policy, maybe. Oh, no one. Okay, just what, what careers are you thinking about then? Oh, I'm definitely thinking about a career. Um, and I'm also trying to figure out the doc and the um, breakout. Sorry. 
Oh yeah, no problem. Can I please repost the bill. Yes. So I went into the breakout and then realized I hadn't, I'd seen the Google Doc link and then not the bill. And so when I came back into the main room to go get it, the chat has been <laughs> wiped, I guess, for me. Okay, so, um, sure, yeah, yeah. I just thought I have so many windows open. Okay. Okay, so here, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you this. I'm not going to give you guys the language that's like the true language of the bill because it's a beat mm -hmm. um, and it's not necessary for this assignment. It's so here is Senator Portantino's like grand summary. It's like a synopsis of all okay. of his favorite arguments for, for the bill. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, so, so, I was, so I was asking what careers you guys oh, were considering. So I know that you guys, yeah, no problem, had had heard already from entrepreneurship, from who else have you guys heard? From? Oh, like uh, like making your resume and your CV. So you guys have had some previous exposure before you guys got to me, but but your fourth year, so you're, so you're all academia. Nice. That would be like us. <laughs> um, no, Industry. they're not all academia. I, they're, they're all a mix trying to figure it out. Uh, we have one acad one person who wants to go to academia, someone who wants to go to R and D research, someone else. I thought science policy is on the table, but yeah, they're discovering what they want to do through this program. So maybe they don't have the answers yet, and okay, they're a mix of I think uh, second and third years, so they they still have some time. You, you don't all right, Michelle? No, this is that link didn't work for me anyway. Okay, what do you, what do you what do you need? How can I help? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll probably just go back into my breakout room and I think uh, well, whoever just was in there had a copy of something, so. Okay. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Hmm. Hmm. Trying to think what I can do in the meantime. Maybe I can make a Google Doc and like link everything there. I don't know. People will figure it out. Yeah, this okay, should but... happen, right? Hmm. Now the others in the breakout room should have what Michelle was looking for. Okay. Okay. So, but okay. So, if we hear something I can talk about is ways, opportunities for um, whether you stay in career science or go elsewhere. Um, once a scientist, always a scientist, right? And so you're going to have domain expertise like wherever you go forever, basically. And so there will always be opportunities for you to be called upon to give your um, scientific advising in a policy context. A perfect example is at the academies, um, I'm on the staff side. So actually um, with my PhD, I'm doing a lot of you know, organizing and I'm shaping agendas and thinking about what's the right complement of minds to have in a room to, to, to ask the question of, for example, super cool, super cool topic. Um, it's called exploring exploring psychedelics and hallucinogens as therapeutic treatments for psychiatric disorders. And some of you may know that Dr. Roland Griffith, who leads the Johns Hopkins Psychedelics and Consciousness Research Center, is like on this committee. And so it's, it's actually quite powerful in a, a version of soft power to have the ability to influence, again, who's in the room when certain conversations are happening. So if, in my particular case, I wanted to make sure, of course, that there was gender and racial parity, but also for this topic that we're talking about sacred medicine in the context of um, indigenous peoples and how they've been using it for centuries. And there's a lot of wisdom there. And so whatever, let's say you have sort of a heart issue or a perspective, you know, given your identity, you can bring that to bear in science policy because you're putting together the agenda. You know, you're inviting, you know, the speaker. That's really cool. But let's say you go forward and you're a career scientist you might be a member on, I might be working for you, right? You might be a member on the committee. And so here's actually one like kind of sidebar about science policy. When you leave, in my case, when I leave academia this early, you're not this, you're no longer the subject matter expert per se. Like I didn't do a postdoc. So I have a lot of, you know, I know a lot of neuroscience. 
But what I am is I'm someone who has enough of a grasp of biomedical you know, research writ large to convene experts, to be able to like totally translate their PowerPoint into something that can actually be presented to a broader audience. Um, I can write a policy memo on like 18 different topics, as opposed to someone who stays in their subject matter expertise and they're narrow and they're specific, uh, but perhaps they're you know, chair of a committee on that specific thing. And so I guess suffice to say, you never know when in your career you may um, become a science policy advisor in a role, give an expert testimony, decide to speak on a bill, um, you know, uh, provide input to the F2, I don't know, to uh, NIH about a new grant stipulation that they have, you know, they have like feedback processes for that. So I see people hopping in and out of the room and I, I know that the documents might not be here anymore that you need. So I kind of want to just check in on you guys. Folks okay? Okay. I'll assume folks are okay until they tell me that they're not okay. Okay. Can I ask something? Yeah. So you said you didn't do postdoc. Was that like, I guess, did it work out for you because you had, I guess, other, other experiences during grad school that kind of like allowed you to transition into this career? Or like, would you also like advice to, because you know, you said to for us to like get involved in other things. So mm -hmm. let's say that we don't have any of that experience during grad school. Like, would you advise to do some kind of, I don't know, like a not a postdoc, but some kind of experience that gets in between, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you know, I I consider postdocs for being well suited for people that are continuing the academic teaching or academic research or both or industry track. I, I certainly would not do a scientific postdoc because you want to be in academia to then get more policy experience. Just go get more policy experience. And you can do that through internships and fellowships, or you can do that through just a, um, you know, sort of like a job, <laughs> an entry level job um, that you may find all the other places that you find jobs, LinkedIn, um, Indeed, Monster, I've used like all of all of the various job boards. Um, I have a whole separate talk on uh, like looking for roles, um, but I definitely Definitely networking is, I hated that word when I was at your guys' stage, but every position that I've gotten or been offered, or I was very close, so they say, came through relationships, right? And so the people that you're in the room with right now, like these connections are effing golden. Like who you go to grad school with, who you're in the trenches with, people that know your personality, your background, your skill sets. Because they're going to be, you know, they're going to be in high, everyone's going to be in high places. And so you can sort of leverage that community for yourself. Like that's how it's done everywhere else. Like people are not shy in business or in finance or in, you know, whatever, you know, marketing about, you know, standing on the shoulders of their buddies. But I feel sometimes in science, we're a little bit like, shy, oh, I don't want to self promote or like, I don't want to be like schleppy. Like, gotta play the game like that's absolutely how you get the good roles and how you like elevate yourself get, make, let your your voice your interest be known that's just general you should like general advice yeah i have a question yeah so in venture capital and industry and things like that there's generally kind of a a path towards you know moving up and into your next role right with more and more you know pay and um as you get increased experience you move to the next kind of tier is there sort of the same path when you go governmental route or do you have to is it more windy um do you just find yourself in a place and get stuck what what have your what's your experience been okay I have to apologize because I was writing a message to the breakout room while you were talking. And so I, I was not fully present for your question. Forgive me. Could you could you please repeat it? Yeah, no problem. Um, like in, in industry and whatnot, you have uh, more or less a set path forward where, you know, one job leads to the next as you increase oh. your pay and your experience. But do you see a similar, you know, pathway in governmental policy and whatnot that, you know, as you get older and better, you you know have a set kind of next tier that you go to 
or is it more windy and whatnot? Right. Okay, that's a great question. Is there a hierarchy? Um, people move around a lot. And there's there's a lot of um people tend to be like jack of all trades. Like some some folks choose to have a science policy like lane, like they do cancer biology and they, you know, they do cancer policy stuff and that's their lane. Other folks like me um have more of a diverse policy background. And so you know, one day they're at the, one year they're at the academies, but then the next they're at RAND, and then after that they're at a nonprofit, and then after that they're at DOD. And, and that's not uncommon and it's not frowned upon at all. But generally, like role wise, you would go from um, like junior associate or associate program officer to senior associate program officer. Then above that is some sort of supervisory or director role. You have reports and you're like, you're overseeing a program. You're probably managing a budget. The, the important thing about supervisory role is managing people and managing money. And then after and then above that, you might be managing other managers, like leaders. It could be a board. You could be managing a committee. You could be managing an entire program that's like a, a higher like level of um, responsibility. And then above that, you're talking like vice president of science policy at insert group here. So those I think are like four chunks that are like vague, like broadly consistent wherever you go. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm thinking about calling the group back so that they can have 10 minutes to pitch. And then it'll be 8.30 local time for me. And then we can uh, switch. And so um, let me see if I'm gonna call the group back. Hopefully they're okay. So, so hopefully you haven't forgotten the bill while <laughs> we've been chatting about other things. Um, school start times, making it so schools can't start before 8.30 because it's like better for the health of the kids and um, the groups were gonna come in and talk to you about it. So here we go. Unlike the advocates, you can vote your conscience. Um, it was just too much work to think of like profiles for a whole bunch of senators. And so be yourself and you know vote vote how you vote how you want to vote. Okay. Okay, welcome back. We're trickling back. Just waiting for folks. Just like move people. Is everyone back? Are we? I feel like we're still missing folks. Yes, everyone is back. There is no Everybody's one. Everybody's back. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay, so so now I'm um, starting with group one. If you guys have a spokesperson, um, let the room know because these senators are cold, right? They've just come out of a lunch conference where um, some like fancy smanchy lobbyists, I guess that's me, were talking their head off about some initiative they really want the senators. And so they, they've been thinking about something else for the past 10, 15 minutes, eating cold cut sandwiches. And now you're here to like talk about your bill. So, you know, they're fresh. They don't pretend they don't remember anything, let them know who your constituency group is, summarize the bill like super quick, uh, your position, and then your advocacy pitch as to why in like two minutes. So let's start with group one. Where are you at? I don't know, Nils, do you want to take it or do you want me to take it? <clears throat> we never got it figured out, sorry. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't care. Up to you. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll start since I was on it. Um, well, I feel like uh, policy is in the role of the government has to be um, reasonable 
and ideally help more people than it hurts. And in this case, uh, later school times might impact a lot of parents' abilities to get kids to school on time, especially since it involves middle schoolers and young high schoolers that don't necessarily have um, the ability to transport themselves or drive themselves. So it still falls on the parents um, potentially. And if school's later, then they may be getting to work later, which have a big in economic impact. And those impacted may be at a bigger disadvantage already in school. And this might cause an even bigger disadvantage for those kids, whereas kids with peer parents that have more flexible uh, work schedules um, would be an advantage there. Um, so uh, parents could always, you know, potentially have their kids go to bed earlier, but that is not the role of the government. So um, I think even though this is a well-intentioned policy, I think that it would end up um, harming the people that are already in a vulnerable position rather than helping. But is that Did enough? You Do you have anything to add? Yep. I'm sorry? And can you remind us who your constituency group is? Uh, we live with the parents, right, <laughs> Niels? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm putting in the chat like a little um, prompt. So our constituency group is, our position is, like yes or no, and then our reasons are blah. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Okay, group two. So that was a no from the, the parent. Group two, Rhett. Sorry, uh, I was, had my microphone muted. Um, so we are representing our constituency group is uh, the transit, the local transportation commissions, uh, the, associate, the association of school association officials, and uh, also the local transit districts. And our position is to vote no on SB 328. Um, and this is because mainly that the uh, SB 328, the school districts already have a very limited number of buses and that uh, currently they have to already have a staggered start time between elementary schools and high schools and middle schools to so that the buses can serve all of their uh, students right now. Um, and so SB 328 would force the schools to start at a more, uh, at around the same time. And so that would mean that uh, all of the students then would not be able to be, um, would not be able to uh, be served by the school buses and would have to take other forms of transportation uh, that, and we, and this would all po uh, possibly cause some, we would have to shift the schedules of the bus buses. And, um, and lastly with SB 328, there's really not any, there's no new funding with it. It's uh, there's no new funding for buses for these school districts to actually buy these buses and to actually get uh, money for us to new hire new drivers and hire everything that we would have to do to be able to actually get these students into school at these times. Excellent, thank you. So that is a no from the transit representative. Okay, so group three. Um, so group three, we represent the um, health professionals in the scientific community. So we are in support of this um, bill because um, we are concerned about the mental health of students in middle school and high school and in reducing suicides and um, depression in young kids. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. our stance. Short and um, sweet is fine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Okay, so that is a yes from the medical representatives of medical and mental health. And okay, uh, so group four, please. Sure, so we represented, I'll just double check, um, various local school districts and um, California School Board of Association and Teachers Association. Um, 
And overall, they also voted no, so against the bill. And a number of reasons they had brought up um, had to do with, um, so like just a number of like restructuring issues when it came to uh, bus transportation, before and after school programming. And one of the major reasons was how this bill would um, disproportionately benefit affluent families as opposed to families that have single working parents. Um, they would have to pretty much be forced to work around their already strict schedules. And so um, overall, um, our clients found that these were kind of major reasons. And it seems like the trend is that this is a lot to ask for for the whole entire state. So um, that was a rough summary of um, the major reasons that uh, our clients voted against the bill. Okay. Uh, thank you, Group 4. So that is a no from a uh, school uh, administrator. Okay, yeah. so um, if, if there are like one or two senators that have a burning question for the advocates, please speak now. Okay. Um, okay, so now we're going to do a uh, roll call vote. So that means I'm gonna call out the last name of the senator and you say aye or no, and then I'm just gonna tally it and we'll see if it passes. So how many senators do we have first of all? One, two, three, four. Well, I don't know how many of you guys are actually here. So we'll just do roll call votes. So, um, Nawalski. No. Thank you. Nichols. Abstain. Havasic. No. Taylor. Taylor abstains. Vidaya. Sorry, are you doing last names? Yes. Oh, that's me. No. <laughs> are you Taylor? Yeah. Taylor is abstained to no. Vidaya. I'm sorry for not pronouncing your last names correctly. Is that my, my name? Yes. No. Vortman. Nay. Vortman, nay. Okay, first name, Isabel. Last nay. name, W. Thank you. Okay. Yamamoto. No. No. Yan. Abstain. Abstain. Yan. Yan abstains. Zhu. Zhu abstains. Zion. Zion abstains. Lee. Lee abstains. So I counted seven nays and six abstains. The bill does not pass. <laughs> there was not a, it was, there was a single I vote. Did I miss any I vote? Man, you guys are a tough crowd. All right, cool. <clears throat> Any reflections on that on that um, uh, experience? Was it was it hard besides like the technical difficulties? Um, what was the feeling? Did you guys find it interesting, challenging? Um, ways that I could do it differently? <laughs> Had I been able to get you all your documents? Um, I felt like it was difficult when I didn't personally support the bill to be a like my constituents would have supported it, I guess. Um, so that was kind of difficult to um, try to figure out why, mm -hmm. like when I don't personally support it, I guess. That happens all the time. And, and so I'm really glad actually that you had that experience because it will happen often, particularly if you're working for a power broker that they will ask you to go gather the best evidence that you can get your hands on to reinforce like their position. So there's, you know, you could say, I come into this conversation, you know, in my mind as white as the driven snow, I have no preconceived notions or opinions, bring me data and I'll make up my mind. That's not real world. Real world is that they often have like a position and then they're like, go find me data to match this position. Like I already know what I'm gonna do. And then, and then you work for them, so that's what you do. However, then you're like, well, what do you do in that situation? I, I, I happen to lean more liberal and I worked for a boss that leaned more moderate. We disagreed on everything. However, when um, shopping or working on bills for him that I, I kind of didn't like, 
you're, you're still there in your science policy capacity to make that bill the best bill it can possibly be. Amendments, revising, um, or let's say you're getting a no recommendation, but they go yes or yes and they go no. Even if they take a different direction, you still advise them about mitigating what you see as some negative consequences that they should walk, watch out for. So actually, when there's um, tension between the consultant you know, um, and their boss, there's actually a lot of really valuable work that can be done um, in the details, in the execution, you know, ways that you can mitigate what you see as like the most um, you know, problematic outcomes. So it's not all about yes or no. It's also about like the how, right? And so that I find that really satisfying. Okay, so now we're gonna switch everyone. So I try, I'm, I'm trying something different this time. I made a Google Drive. So I hope everyone is able to use Google and I made it like a universal link. So I'm gonna sh share that link with you if it'll let me. Okay. Okay, great. Mm. And it's the same deal. There's a background form. There's a background form for everyone. And then like um, some information about, and it's just two constituencies this time. So there will be group one and group two. All right. So I can also drop the link again for who your groups are. So that way the senators can know like where to go. There you go. So I hope the Google Drive works better. Make sure people are getting the documents you see. Okay. That people here generally senators, yes? I don't think the breakout rooms are open. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. Okay, that's fine, actually, because I realized that I didn't like summarize the bill for you guys really quick. So let me do that while everyone's still here. Um, quick summary of the bill. This is a bill, real bill, like in process, in contention in California by Senator um, Scott Wiener from San Francisco, which is relevant. There's a, a, a big um, unhoused population that also a lot of them struggle with substance abuse disorders. And he's proposing a um, that there would be set up safe injection sites at locations around the city where people could come and that they would be um, like indemnified from any like uh, law enforcement prosecution where they would be uh, provided a safe place to, um, to, uh, to, to engage in their nar narcotic. But the idea would be that this would reduce the spread of disease. They'd be, this is the, you know, sort of the pro that they would um, be getting clean needles and that it sort of contains and mitigates the broader public health issue. So this is like a big controversial conversation happening in California right now. Are we gonna allow people to like shoot up <laughs> uh, like on um, in, in these safe injection sites because you know, perhaps it has secondary goals that are um, seen, as, seen as valuable. Okay, so with that background, now I'll open the breakout rooms. Thank you. All right. So from the document, it's not clear what position is for the group. Am I missing something? No, I, I left it blank because I, I kind of wanted you guys to read some of the background and see if you could surmise it. Um, I, but if not, like I, I can certainly tell you, but it, it's okay if it takes you a bit to, to figure it out. So one group is um, um, drug policy advocates, um, harm reduction folks. And the other group is broadly law enforcement. And so those are the two sort of fault lines. So I would use, I would click around the links in the background. Okay. To see um, what, folks, what folks are saying. I would also actually, 
the first bullet point in background is the bill analysis. And I should have made this more clear earlier. But in the bill analysis, it has like arguments in support and arguments in opposition on the very like last couple of pages. And so you can browse around there. But the whole document has sort of a broader overview about you know what the bill's trying to accomplish and issues. Don't try to like absorb the entire thing. I just want you guys to get a sense and then think about, okay, I represent harm reduction, mental health people. What do they seem to be thinking about this versus I represent law enforcement, sheriffs, DA, district attorney. What are they thinking about this? All right, thanks. Yeah, sure. I, I wish I would have been more clear. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Quick question for you. So yeah. I, <clears throat> I was a, um, uh, like a policy advocate last time, uh, yeah. but I'm listed to be in group one this time. Is it okay if, if I stay and be a senator? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's okay. Okay. It, yes. Yes. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Be here. Okay. So okay. what we do here is this is such a big class. It's hard to do like FAQ with, you know, 30 people. This is half of you. And so um, if you guys wanted um, me to expand more on certain themes or talk about past roles or applying for fellowships or like whatever, I'm more than happy to. But how many folks by show of hands um, are interested maybe in science policy? Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. Yeah. So let me give you guys back some time. Like what, what questions do you still have? Um, or, you know, what more would you like to know about? So I'm really interested in, uh, you were talking about science for policy versus policy for science. Um, and that's a term, a term I hadn't heard before and I, I, I'm like super intrigued. Um, and I like really appreciate all your examples, um, but I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, they were more science for policy themed. Um, do you have like, I guess, insights or, uh, you know, ways in which to seek out the policy for science aspect as opposed to yeah. the, yeah. Okay. The science for policy aspect, science, I'm reminding myself, <laughs> the science about how the enterprise of, of science is run, you would often find at um, member um, scientific societies member-driven societies and organizations mm -hmm. where they are then broadly representing the interest of their membership base. For example, I'm a neuroscientist, so we have the Society for Neuroscience. And so um, when the NIH or um, the folks at Jackson Labs, you know, who make the mice or you know, whatever, or mm -hmm. NSF change their policies around programs, around funding, around how many grad students you can have, around um, what, how you define early, mid and late stage career research or whatever, representatives from SFN are like on, you know, on the pulse of that as their full-time job. And they will then go to um, some like leading SFN thinkers and be like, hey, this is happening. Um, let your people know and let us know how you'd like us to respond. Do you want us to write a opposition letter? Do you want us to like go rally up some senators and then make a big fuss? Do you want us to submit some amendments? And so, so there, um, in almost all these roles, you're sort of an intermediary between yeah. the constituency and, you know, the stuff happening in the power broker room. That's one example. Um, another science for policy example, a, a lot of it is funding and a lot of it is how science programming is organized. Um, how many international students you can have, like J-1 visas. Um, Gosh, like international travel, like funding international, or like um, shared resource management. So I did one project that was about better policies to allow institutions that are nearby to share their like their confocals, or uh, policies that make it easier for neighboring but different institutions, like I don't know Hopkins and Maryland, to be able to transport um, sensitive materials like viruses or mice. Like, yeah, because you have to like leave the lab and like go outside and, and there's like all this paperwork. Uh, what are ways that we can make that easier so that you can facilitate collaboration? Like that's policy. Is that your question or did I reverse it? No, no, that that answered okay. it perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
like how to make how to make the enterprise like because it's a business really how exactly you make the business of science more efficient more okay mm -hmm. oh, I got a perfect example for you um at the academies we did a five-part workshop series it's sort of in, with the pandemic and Black Lives Matter in mind on um the future of grad school training right um, maybe gone are the days where one person slaves away in a lab and has a first author paper. Like science is becoming really big, really like multi field. Um, how do we like shape labs in such a way that the statistician and the breeder and the person who like does the recordings and the analyst like are all able to share credit, um, even if they're not first author in a way that can advance their career? In what ways is the first author like gets the gold, you know, model kind of hurting us? Um, we're losing women in the pipeline in a really terrible way. What do we do about that? Do we stop the tenure clock? It was all about like the culture of scientific lab. Um, the workshop talked about mentoring and, and why is there really, this is me, Chanel talking now, not more accountability around like when mentors are, are bad and really toxic. We don't reward mentorship in our, um, sort of measure of what makes a good scientist. It's all how many grants you have and how many papers you have. What about how many amazing students you train, regardless of where they went? Like, should that be a section in your grant application, like quality of mentorship? So like that's definitely science for policy. <laughs> the science of inclusion, the science of equity in the enterprise of research itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was, that was awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that's kind of interesting. Like, um, we we're focusing on government the first time, but like, I guess, kind of basically what you were saying, and then my perception is that when it comes to um, how we make policy for science, it's not normally happening in the legislatures, except for really big things that are on the radar of legislatures, like stem cells and and whether or not to test for COVID or, or whatnot, but at the, at the, from what you're saying, for the most part, it, it happens at the agency or below yeah. or the institution, the policy for actually figuring out what to do about science is happening. Um, but I guess, well, I used to be a budget, budget analyst, but I guess the way that I interacted with that was um, for the NSF, uh, since I was applying to NIDDK, I looked up their strategy the five-year strategy, five-year plan, if I'm evil. And I looked at it because I, I mean, I wanted to see what their strategic priorities were and policies. And yeah. that was interesting and helpful to know whether or not what I wanted to do was mm. in line with what their five-year plan was and, and what they're advocating in terms of what they want science policy to be and whether, where that fits. So yeah, that's an interesting exercise. Yeah, thank um, you for sharing that, Michelle. I like I like that you were looking at. Um, you can tell a lot about an institution's real values and priorities from their budget, <laughs> because where where the money hits the road, like that's brass tacks for real. I mean, the mission statements are like so. Care I mean, I know they seem kind of fluffy, like pie in the sky statements, but they're so carefully worded, and it goes mm -hmm. through a million committees that. It's, interest, it's interesting what gets put in a mission statement or five-year plan. It's also interesting what's missing. And so given the current climate you know, that we're in, when certain keywords and phrases are missing, it's almost like deafening that certain issues yeah. are like left off the table. And so it's, it's, I used to think, oh, who cares about a mission statement? That's just you know, executive speak, like I, I'm doing the real work. But like, no, it tells you a lot about the culture of the organization, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Hannah asked work-life balance and salaries. I, I find work-life balance to be amazing. I work a nine to five. I almost never ever work after hours. It's super rare. People don't email you after five o'clock. <laughs> like they really respect the nine to five for the most part. Um, and then the salaries in the nonprofit world, it's not very competitive, I have to say. Um, however, in government, what's nice is that as a PhD, you automatically, by virtue of your doctorate, qualify at the level of a GS-11, which I think stands for general scale or government scale. But anyway, it's a scale by which all federal you know, employees are ranked. And um, I think like an, at a master's, you're at GS-10, at a 
PhD or GS11 as a postdoc with X years of experience or GS12 and above. Anyway, but just to suffice it to say, a GS11, um, and then there's like a, a range within that, like step one through 12, it's kind of a weird system. But GS11 ranges in DC from like, uh, like 85K on the lower end, maybe like maybe 75 to 85K to like low 90s or like the low 100. Like it's, it's, it's decent, right? I mean, you DC cost of living is high. Um, and so, so if you can get yourself in the GS, like at NSF or something like that, um, and, and you would come in at an 11 and then you, you grow from there, that's, that's fine. Um, sectors that pay more um, are for sure the uh, for-profit, you know, biotech and industry. Um, DOD pays well, and again, that's government, DOE pays well. Um, however, what I, what I will say for government jobs that may not pay very well is you, you can't, um, or rather, what you do, what you are getting instead is like influence, I mean, tremendous influence. I couldn't believe the stuff they were putting me in charge of as a junior staffer in the California State Legislature when I, when I knew nothing about transit. And they were like, yeah, but like, you seem smart. And like, you know, you have a couple of months to figure it out. And, you know, they were like, come up with some amendments, like propose me an alternative. Like, you know, like, it's just, they, they give you a tremendous degree of trust. And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful feeling when you see the bill that you like had your hands on, like move on to another committee. And one of my bills actually did get signed into law. And it's like, wow. So I wasn't paid very much during that process. But for me personally, the sense of satisfaction that I carry from knowing that like, that's a real policy that affects real people, um, you know, doesn't like feed me literally, but it, it feeds my spirit. So that counts for something. <laughs> um, one thing about government though, is that the benefits are really good. Uh, yeah, the, the, the benefits are good, good pension, like family leave and good retirement and, and, and all that. So depends on, you know, what your, your cost benefit. Um, oh, I was saying to the other group that even if for, for folks that don't really know or are thinking that it's not science policy, um, as in like being a science policy staffer, you're, you're always going to have domain specific expertise just because of the education that you have right now. And so it could be 10, 20 years from now that you're, you get a call from a staffer at the academy saying, hey, we think you'd be a really great person to like sit on our workshop. So that someone like me would be working for someone like you, right? Where you're the ideas generator, you're the deep you know, industry insider subject matter expert. And I'm the program manager who's sort of like spinning all the plates and holding it together, but you're really sort of the intellectual drive. And so there's different roles for people who are um, in different lanes. And so I've left academia, so I'm no longer going to be the premier subject matter expert in anything. Um, you know, like I'm going to be sort of more of a generalist. I'm going to know about how to navigate policy process. I'm going to know how to manage a committee. I'm going to know like how to take some scientific data and like turn it into a salvageable law maybe, but I don't, but I'm not going to be like the world expert in infectious disease or whatever, but you guys in however many years might be, and you might be the person that I then, you know, interview to like get, you know, information for the report that I'm writing. And so you could see how you can be on different ends of this. And so don't, don't, don't rule it out. Um, for example, at the academy, some people come and they do a workshop or they give a talk and then they're gone, but they've provided like really great content for us to do um, our work. And so I, you can consider it service, civic service, if you will, to be a science policy expert at some point in your career if given the opportunity. Um, local opportunities include like going to speak in support or opposition of a bill. So few people like go to town halls or go to council meetings and so in Sacramento, I, I used to go to a lot. And so it's always, it's certain personalities, like local, like moms and like interesting personalities that like really, really care, but they often have very strong and like interesting views that, and they're like very um, like committed to an idea. And so I think it would be great to have more like diversity in the types of folks that like regularly go to town hall meetings. And it's not just like, you know what I mean? This, the, the types that get up and like rants and rave about their favorite topic every time. And you're like, okay, Joel, we get it, you know. 
And so that that's it, it's a place for your voice to be heard for a minimal effort. There's so few people there that are speaking on an issue. If you go and you're flashing around your scientific credentials, like people notice and they pay attention and you make a big splash because you're in a small pond. And so that there's something to be said for like all policy is local. All right, so since we're at about seven minutes, I'm gonna uh, broadcast to the group that we're gonna come back soon. All right. What's your, what's your experience then of this course? You guys seem to be about like halfway through-ish, maybe a third of the way through. How's it going? Good. What else? Um, I feel like when I was in grad school, I didn't hear enough about DOD and DOE opportunities. And they're actually like desperate, turns out, for STEM talent. They have like all these initiatives to try to get more civilian scientists working on national security, working on nuclear, working on um, public health uh, as a national security issue. And so there's a lot of really, really, really interesting um, like very technical work um, happening in those departments that I would encourage people to, to look out for and they pay, they pay well. Um, Arlington's not that far away. Okay. All right, so I close the breakout room. People will start making their way back and then we'll spend the last couple of minutes doing the pitches and then a quick vote. And then um, I'll, Put up my contact information so you guys can reach out to me if you want, you know, a one on one and then and then we'll we'll head out. Okay, are we all back? Are we? We're all coming back. I can't like tell when we're all back. It's weird. I don't know where to look. All right. All right, great. I think we're all back now. Okay, great. So, um, senators. You've been wined and dined by a fancy fancy lobbyist for lunch, and so um, you're coming back, and, but you're you're fresh and you're really excited to hear about this bill um, about um, drug overdose prevention by um, Senator Scott Weiner of San Francisco. And so Group One is again going to say our constituency group is, our position is, and our reasons are. And Group One, I'll let you take it away. Cool. Uh, our constituency consists of a broad base of public, medical, and mental health organizations, as well as community support organizations. We strongly urge you to vote in favor of this bill. This is one of the only bills proposing a practical means of combating the major issue of drug and overdoses facing our communities. The proposed plan will reduce overdoses, which in turn would reduce strains on other emergency and public health responses. The amnesty provisions in this proposal will also alleviate strain on our law enforcement agencies, freeing up resources to focus on other matters facing our policy, policing institutions. Already in Canada and elsewhere, similar initiatives are showing positive outcomes. These initiatives not only reduce overdose deaths and its strain on our communities, but also hope um, and recovery options to the victims of addiction. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, that is a uh, I recommendation from group one. Group two, please. Okay, we are group two. Our constituency groups are um, the Alliance to Protect Children, the California Family Council, the Governor of California, and then a bunch of law enforcement and police organizations. Um, our position is against, and our reasons are that this bill does not actually address any of any solutions to drug addiction. 
and like they don't have any like provisions for like um, methadone alternatives to these drugs, like any mandatory treatment protocols or drug counseling systems in place. And so we don't believe that it'll do anything to actually solve this problem. And then based on the previous um, trials of these kinds of programs that were in Canada and other locations, um, they found that the consistent use of these injection sites by individuals is very low and that it causes um, people who are addicted to drugs to like kind of congregate in these neighborhoods which could be a safety issue and that um, deaths from overdose in the vicinity of the injection sites um, actually increase as a result. So yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. That is a no recommendation from group two. <clears throat> if, if, is there one senator perhaps that has a burning question for the advocates? Okay, hearing none, we will continue with our roll call vote by last name. Okay, voting starts now. Um, Baron. Baron abstains. Bennett. Bennett abstains. Benning. Abstain. Can you repeat? Abstain. Benning abstains. Biederman. I'll just say aye. <laughs> Biederman, aye. Blunden. Blunden abstains. No, nope, no, nope, sorry, aye. Blunden changes from abstain to aye. Condon. Condon abstains. Dallin. No. Dallin, no. Jad. Jaja. Aye. Jaja, aye. Guy. Aye. Guy, aye. Holler. No. Holler, no. Herlock. No. Herlock, Herlock, no. Hozon. No. Hozan, no. Mendoza. Aye. Mendoza, aye. Have all senators voted who wanted to vote? I'll vote. Aye. Aye. Okay. The ayes are six. The noes are four. The abstains are four. What's our total here? 14. It has to get half or more. The bill does not pass. Files closed. Wow. So we have six eyes, four no's, and four abstains out of 14 people. We would have needed eight to pass, eight eyes to pass. Split decision. Now, what's really interesting is that all of these, you know, mental health and you know, medical associations um, were, were voting I. And here we are, a group of scientists voting your conscience, uh, and the vote did not pass. My lesson with this to say is that when folks say, follow the science, that only takes you so far, right? There's implementation, there's, there's all of this other nuance and context and follow the science. It's like, whose science? There's the science of like, this doesn't work. There's the science of, well, we, you know. And so um, I, I think it, it's becoming a bit of a, an oversimplified phrase to say, just follow the science as if it somehow gives you an answer. It's more of a tool, it's a way of assessing data. But at the end of the day, people have to make um, value judgments, right? Um, everyone has their, their own uh, sort of priority set and that's a political process. So with that, I hope that you've sort of learned how to um, pull a position from a bill given a stakeholder background. I hope you've I've gotten exposed to the idea that science is a tool and not like the end all be all answer that sometimes you might disagree with the scientific group or you know, um, other you know, um, perspectives that come to play. And you've got like a whirlwind tour of career options in science policy. Oh, let me just put up my contact information. So you guys can take a picture if you want. And then um, I wanna be respectful of your time so we can close. But thank you guys for being, here we go. Such a great class and for bearing with me. I hope you guys had fun in the breakout rooms. It was meant to be just kind of fun and you know, try try something new. And so that that's it for me, but I'll stick around if you guys have any questions.